So uh, a little bit about me in case you don't know who I am. Uh, my name is Scott Lowe. I am a uh, VCBX number 49. And uh, uh, a VX for the last couple of years. We'll see if they honor me again this year with another one. Uh, uh, author of uh, three uh, vSphere related books. So Mastering VMware vSphere 4, uh, VMware vSphere 4 Administration and Reference. And the last that uh, I just published with two other authors, Forms Got 3 and Mace Sidel Keesing, the uh, VMware vSphere Design, which got published just back in uh, March. So, and blogger uh, at blog.scottlow.org, and just general all around uh, geek. So I like playing with technology. Uh, so uh, Twitter handle is there in case you guys use Twitter. If you want to take pictures, you want to tweet, uh, you want to post them to Facebook while we're doing this, by all means, feel free. Uh, that, you know, all kinds of interaction is encouraged. Not just you know, to ask some questions, although that's certainly welcome in here. If you have any questions, just stick your hand up and ask. Uh, but by all means, feel free to live blog or live tweet or Whatever. You probably won't be as famous as the guy who live, live tweeted the Osama raid, but you might be famous nevertheless anyway. Okay. So we'll take a quick look at the agenda here. I'm just going to do a real quick review of stretch clusters with regards to definition, because stretch clusters can mean different things to different people. So I want to be clear about what we're talking about when we talk about it. Is that the number two? Yeah. Okay. So just real quick definition so that we can be clear about what we're talking about when I say we're going to talk about pros and cons for stretch clusters. And I think those doors are locked so you can try to go in as well. Then we'll go into some considerations around stretch clusters. And this is where we'll begin talking about the pros and the cons of this particular design and you know, what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, I originally had this slide deck set up so that uh, it was a list of all the pros and then a list of all the cons, but in looking at how the content fits together, and if any of you are on your journey to VCDX, the, the next thing that we'll talk about is, is probably something you've heard far too often, but it's, it's all about how these things interrelate to each other. And so it was very difficult to take and, and discuss the, the pros or the advantages of using a stretch cluster without also at the same time talking about the disadvantages because they're so inherently related, you know, talking about how this has an impact on something else, right? Knowing how these pieces are interconnected and interrelated and changing one thing changes something else. So I reworked it um, to just talk about the considerations and focus on a few different areas, how uh, stretch clusters have advantages and disadvantages in various different areas like networking, storage, uh, high availability, that kind of thing. Then I'll take a few minutes uh, with some forward-looking statements. Um, I want to be clear that forward-looking statements are not a um, indication of anything that is definitely going to happen or not going to happen, okay? Uh, so I do work for EMC. I'm not here as an EMC representative, um, but I do work for EMC, and so I don't want to give you the impression that anything I may have to say is an inside look at what uh, VMware or EMC or any other vendor may be working on. But just some thoughts out loud from somebody who's talked about stretch clusters and uh, discussed them in a number of different venues, some what if scenarios, what if this were to change, uh, how would a, uh, a, a, an improvement or a modification in this particular area uh, affect the overall design decision, that sort of thing. And then finally, uh, we'll have a, a dedicated time for Q&A, but of course you are welcome to ask questions anywhere along the way. So feel free to interrupt me, stick your hand up, whatever, okay? All right, so let's jump right in. First, a quick review of stretch clusters, what it is we're talking about, what do we mean when we say stretch cluster, okay? So a stretch cluster is going to be a, a, uh, a VMware cluster, ESX, ESXi hosts, okay, in different physical locations. That could be two different buildings on the same campus, okay? Although typically when we talk about a stretch cluster, we're talking about two different uh, locations uh, spanned by some geography, okay? Uh, right now, because of various reasons, uh, we'll talk about that more in a moment, these different geographic sites are typically within 100 kilometers or so of each other. But we're talking about having a data center at uh, you know one facility and some number of miles away or some number of kilometers away, uh, another facility, and you have a single cluster with hosts in both locations stretched across that distance. Okay. Now, why do uh, why do customers build stretch clusters? Well, typically, the key word that you're looking for is they're going to say, "I want." 
active, active data centers. Okay? So unlike your GR type uh, approach where you've got a data center with some number of ESX or ESXi hosts and storage and VMs running, and then you may have all that stuff replicating over here to another site, which is not um, typically not running workloads, okay? And they're going to do a failover uh, of some mechanism, whether it be manual, whether it be by a site recovery manager, whatever. Uh, you will see customers wanting to build stretch clusters because they want to have the ability to have workloads running in both data centers at the same time. And typically they want to be able to move workloads back and forth between these data centers simply by use of vMotion. Okay, they don't want to have to go through the process of any sort of failover mechanism. So while SRM could do something like this, uh, there would be an outage involved. You know, it would have to shut down VMs, fail the VMs over, uh, break replication, that sort of thing, okay? So they want high availability across sites, they want to do workload balancing across sites, they want active, active data centers. And, to, and not active, active as in, as in the phrase of, um, you know, active, passive pairs pointing in opposite directions, okay? Um, which you could do that too. You could say, I have site A and site B, and site B is going to be failover for site A, and site A is going to be failover for site B, and that makes me active active. Uh, yeah, in a sense, I guess you could look at it that way. But we're, customers are building trust questions because they want to actually have workloads running and be able to dynamically balance those workloads between the sites very, very easily with minimal disruption. So that's what we talk about. We talk about stretch clusters. That's the kind of, of specific piece we're talking about. Now, as we uh, as we talk about stretch clusters, I'll point out that uh, the use of VMware HA and VMware DRS is not a requirement for a stretch cluster. I can build stretch clusters without HA DRS, but because of what customers are trying to accomplish with stretch clusters, you will typically find that HA DRS are used in conjunction with stretch clusters. Okay. And as we go through this, and I talk about some of the pros and the cons and the considerations to keep in mind, I'll show you that a lot of the the advantages of stretch clusters, as well as a number of the disadvantages of stretch clusters, stem directly from the inclusion of HADRS in that architecture. Okay. Um, one important thing to point out here before I move into the considerations is the point that um, if you are interested in doing long distance vMotion, which has garnered a lot of attention for a lot of different reasons, if you're interested in doing long distance vMotion, stretch clusters are not a prerequisite. Now, those of you that have been in the virtualization space for a while know that vMotion can be initiated between any two hosts, regardless of their cluster membership. What is the one requirement, aside from all the other technical you know, pieces, what is the one requirement for vMotion between two hosts? Single data center. Single data center, right, okay? So I, I don't have to do a stretch cluster to actually do long distance vMotion. And I point that out because I talk with customers and they're like, oh, well, we don't be able to do long distance vMotion. Okay, great, fine, no problem. There are a lot of considerations around the architectures required to do that. Let's talk about those. Um, and they say, but well, we're going to build a stretch cluster so we can do that. Well, you don't have to stretch your clusters to do that. You could put a cluster here and a cluster there, and you can just be motion between them with no issues whatsoever. Oh, I thought they had to be a cluster. No, they don't. So it's important to remember is that stretch clusters are not a requirement for long distance be motion. Okay? How many people in here? Uh, we'll start uh, with the kind of ideal. So how many people in here have, by my definition, a stretch cluster today? Awesome. Okay. You guys running HA DRS? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Okay. Well, maybe if we have time towards the end, I'd love to hear do some feedback from you, if you're willing to do that. Okay. Good or bad, doesn't matter. Okay. If you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. No worries. All right. So let's jump into some considerations. Okay. We, we've taken a quick look at what uh, stretch clusters are, by the definition, now let's look at some considerations of what's involved when we start actually looking at building and operating stretch clusters. So, I'm going I'm to break this into a series of discussions. We'll focus first on uh, considerations or impacts or pros and cons, whatever phrase or terminology you want to use, around storage. Okay? Now, remember that the reason, generally speaking, customers build uh, stretch clusters is because they want active, active data centers. They want data centers that can run workloads at both ends at any given time. And they want to be able to shift workloads back and forth between them. So typically you're going to see uh, that in order to really be able to do that, you have to have read-write storage 
at both ends. Okay? And I'm going I'm to flip ahead and, and go through a, a, a quick piece. So I'm going to gloss over this real quick because I'm going to talk about this in the diagram next. But I do want to point out that uh, because of the various storage requirements, and I'm going to go into this in more detail, this is where our, our, our approximately 100 kilometer distance limitation comes in because we have to limit ourselves to solutions that provide synchronous uh, mirroring or synchronous access to data, okay? Rather than an asynchronous where we can stretch that distance over, or, or stretch those clusters over, or hosts over a much greater distance. Let me jump into the diagram here. Okay, so here we have uh, you know, a very simplistic uh, stretch cluster design. I've got a host or a group of hosts, and they are accessing some form of storage uh, in, in their local lo uh, location, okay? And then there is a, uh, an interconnect of some sort, and typically this interconnect, and I don't know how well my colors turned out, but typically this interconnect is going to carry uh, your SAM traffic, okay, which could you know, generally be you know, a fabric A, fabric B type thing for full redundancy, and then we'll also carry uh, some back-end storage traffic, and then separate from this, and I'll talk more about that part in a moment, separate from this would be your networking uh, connect, okay? So right now we're just talking storage traffic. So this is not representative of what we'd have to do on the IP side to provide connectivity between VMs and all that jazz. So we've got some, you know, this this uh, this piece here. There's a lot of different architectures here, a lot of different products that can that can do this. Okay, um, I'll mention just a couple that I know about, and there may be more. And feel free to jump in if you know of others. Okay, um, NetApp Metro Cluster um, is a is a solution that does that. And that's where they take one controller. Uh, um, or a single cluster controller, split the cluster controller, stretch them out across the distance. You've got one controller in site A, one controller in site B. You've got some sort of connecting between here, whether it's a fabric interconnect or just a direct connect, uh, typically it's fiber. And then you have shelves attached to each of those, and then the shelves are cross connected as well. And I was going to go through diagrams for all this stuff, and I thought, you know, I'll just explain. I'm lazy. What can I say? Sorry, guys. Um, but. Uh, and so they've got that. Now, I'm, I'm going to come down from the platform for a minute. Okay. So in, in that sort of scenario, what you've got is storage control over here in site A, storage control over here in site B, and then these shelves here, which connect to the local storage controller and then also through the screen line, also connect to the other storage controller. And that's so that if either storage controller fails, you've still got the ability to continue running. Okay? But what you have in that particular scenario is um, you actually have, you, you don't have read write storage at both locations. Um, you have two pairs of read write read only storage. It's kind of this, this thing again, okay? Where one controller is read write on one side, read only on the other. The other controller is read write on its side, read only on the other. And then if a controller fails, then the controller, or the ownership of that fails over and then goes from there. Um, and so that's one way of handling it. There um, are some other products. I've talked with some folks from HP about the left-hand solution. Haven't been able to get a whole lot of detail there, but they say the left-hand solution could also do something similar, where we've got a controller or node over here, and a controller or a node over here, and the ability to have, um, they say, actually read right on both sides, but I haven't been able to get them to tell me actually how that works yet. So I'm not saying it doesn't work, just they haven't been able to explain to me yet. Um, and then another product would be uh, EMC's VPlex, which would have uh, same sort of a general architecture. You would have a, a one or more storage controllers on one side, one or more storage controllers on the other side. The key difference there is that the data is actually read-write in both locations at the same time, uh, which is, as far as I'm aware, uh, very uh, unusual um, and not commonly seen in a lot of other products. Been some discussion that Hitachi High Availability Manager does something similar, but I haven't had Hitachi actually tell me for sure how that really works yet. So, but you need read write storage of locations, and here's why. Let's say that we have a VM, okay, running on a host in site A. And the storage that it's accessing is here also in site A. And so it's got read write storage to its, its VMDK, which may be, let's say, on some fiber channel, or SCSI, whatever the case may be. It's got a read write storage to its, to its, uh, to its storage, uh, read write access to its storage. It's reading and writing, everything's great, and you're, you're just, you're, you're going, everything's fine. And then you decide, you know, I want to move this VM. I want to do a migration of this VM over to the other site for workload balancing, for disaster avoidance, for whatever the use case may be. So you initiate the motion and move the VM over to the other site. Now, if you leave it like this, what's the problem? Yeah, your storage is still over there, right? 
And so what happens is, depending on the latency there, now, if we're talking, you know, a building and a few hundred meters away, another building, your latency is probably nothing, you know, a, maybe a millisecond at most, okay? Uh, and so that would be negligible. But as you begin to stretch these clusters over greater geographic distances, all the way up to the 100 kilometers that most people enforce, roughly around right 100 kilometers for synchronous replication or synchronous mirroring, you begin to see greater and greater uh, latencies. And so what happens is for every single write or every single read that has to happen there, you end up taking a, store, you end up taking a performance hit. Because it, it can't access the storage locally, that's, that's read only. It has to access the storage remotely, which is the only read write location, unless you actually have the ability to provide read write storage in both locations at the same time. And that's why that's a critical piece for actually doing a stretch cluster. It's because you've got VMs running in both locations, or potentially running in both locations at the same time, and you need to be able to have them access their local storage without having to incur a performance penalty across the land. Now, the, the way you can fix that um, today without any sort of platform that does read write um, access to both sides is then do a storage migration, a storage fee motion from one site to the other. But of course, as we know, that's bandwidth intensive, time intensive, labor intensive. Okay? And it doesn't lend itself very well to some sort of dynamic workload balancing to say, well, I've got a VM and it's got 60 gigs of data that move with it, and I want to move it over there because I've got more CPU RAM, RAM capacity. Well, that means I also have to spend the two or three hours on the link or whatever it takes to move that 60 gigs of data also over to the other location. Right? So there, there's, a, there's an issue there in terms of how we can actually operationalize this if we didn't have the ability for storage to actually be right in both locations. So as you look at stretch clusters and, and how that works, again, depending on your particular implementation, and really it's all about the details, right, for, for lack of a better term. If you're a mile away, you're probably not going to notice any certain perceptible difference, depending on the quality of your life. If you're an ATT customer, you might notice that was a joke. Um, but uh, you know, when you start moving out to 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers, 80 kilometers, that kind of stuff, you may begin seeing some performance differences. Again, depending on the quality of your link. So that's why we say that when you look at building stretch clusters, and the consideration here is that you have to look at storage technologies that will support the idea of stretch clusters. Right? Your your kind of traditional regular storage architecture isn't going to really support that. You can't say I'm going to buy, um, you know, a standard, you know, active, passive, mid-range array. I'm going to buy two of them. I'm going to stick one here and one there because that's not going to work. They can't access the same data at the same time to enable you to move those VMs back and forth. Okay. So there's special architectures, like I said, the metro cluster where you're taking split controllers apart. Okay. Or VPlex, which is a piece that sits in front or whatever the case may be, okay? Um, so talk with your storage vendor, find out what their strategy is. Uh, do they have a strategy providing uh, access to storage locally uh, to support this sort of thing uh, if you're looking at stretch clusters? Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? Questions around that consideration before we move on? Yes, in the back. So let me repeat the question as I understand it. Um, we're, we're talking about, you know, I want to provide some, some form of active, active uh, data center, but I can't afford to have, you know, the, the top of the line stuff in both locations. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to invest in my primary location, and it's going to get, you know, the stuff that I really want, and I'm going to invest in the secondary location, and it's going to be maybe a notch down. Uh, you know, maybe slightly slower, whatever the case may be. Uh, can I do that with a stretch cluster design? Really, when, with regards to storage, it all comes down to the technology that your vendor is going to offer you with the ability to do this, okay? So, if, if their technology allows you to kind of mix and match storage types or, or arrays or, you know, whatever on the back end, then that might be possible. I know there's been some discussion around some of the so uh, software-based storage virtualization, like DataCore, Sans Symphony, and some of the others, Falcon Store, 
They may have some sort of functionality like this, and because they're virtualized in the backend storage, you may be able to do that. Um, the VPlex product will allow you to do that as well. Um, I think probably a met, uh, Metro cluster built on a V-series, if that's a support configured, I don't know if it is or not, um, would probably be able to do the same sort of thing. But it's really, you have to talk to your particular storage vendor and find out how they would implement that particular piece. But from a, from a VMware storage design, as long as the storage is available in both locations, it doesn't matter how it's provided. Does that answer your question? Okay, great question. What other questions before I move on? Yes, sir. So the question is, is there a way we could rehome the active storage piece uh, in this sort of scenario? And again, that's going to be a vendor specific piece. So if we look at, um, if we look at uh, the way most of these would work, um, I'm going to say not easily, based on what I know from, from the various solutions. Now, I don't know all there is to know about every possible solution that might do this for the storage. So I'm thinking about the top two to three that I do know about, and um, it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be an easy piece it, it, if your storage is one that where it's read write read only and then and then it's flipped. You know, so you have this cross pointing pairs, right? And you want to switch that for just one line or something of that nature. Um, most of those types of solutions would require you to do a storage free motion. Um, which is kind of what you're trying to avoid, right? Um, the data is already over there anyway. So, well, yeah, I would be able to just kind of switch over, right? Uh, and most of them won't give you that functionality. Um, but <coughs> you, uh, you really need to talk to them. Um, and if you, want to, if you want to talk about how the v would handle that, just catch me afterwards, and I can talk about that. Later. <coughs> All right, so, uh, other questions on storage? I'm going to pour myself some glass of water real quick while you guys ruminate. Which is a fancy word for You mentioned um, people are trying to avoid storage emotion in the location. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's to do that. And the time it takes to complete it. How do you feel about various network vendors who come in and say, well, we can optimize your IP layers such so that the time it takes to do that storage emotion is a quarter or Well, I think that there, so the question was, you know, what about bandwidth optimization type products? How would that impact or affect the need to remove a storage view motion? Either way, we've got to move 50 or 60 or 100 gigs of data. The benefit that bandwidth optimization products have is that they remove some of the overhead involved in a typical IP type connection. Uh, optimizing a TCP window, removing handshakes, uh, those sorts of things, right? Um, so they would make the bandwidth more efficient, but they wouldn't necessarily reduce the amount of data that actually has to be moved. Now, by making that more bandwidth more efficient, you might reduce the overall time, right? Um, I do. I, I would say, not being an expert in those particular products, I would say that there's only so much we can do at that layer to optimize, right? So yes, you can see some benefits. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't counter that, but I think that the margin of benefit is going to be a little smaller than, than being able to say, the data is already there, because I'm leveraging some sort of mirroring or cross-replication, and I want to just basically turn on the read right plan. The reason I ask this is I've uh, heard quite a number of customers who have, who might have five already, but mm -hmm. they wouldn't read that much more to be licensed for their folks to be pushed to the without the need for a highly specialized storage layer. Well, the important thing, yeah. So you mentioned F5. The important thing to, to keep in mind here is that we're talking only the storage components here. So we haven't even touched yet the networking side of it, right? Where we have to talk about layer two adjacency or its equivalent, where products like F5 might be able to step in and do something around that, um, but they would that, that that functionality probably would not do anything for the underlying storage. Right? So that's something to keep in mind. That's why we kind of have to slice this onion a couple different ways to look at it from a few different angles. All right, so let's, let's move ahead. Great questions, thank you all. One, one final question real quick. Uh, what about full color? Um, let me talk about that in the next section. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's, let's move on to the next consideration area, and that's, that's VMware HA. 
We talked about stress busters and, and VMWare not being a, a requirement for stress clusters. In other words, I can build a stress cluster without turning on VMWare HA. But the reason that a lot of people build stretch clusters, in addition to the idea of um, you know, active active data centers, is because they say, I want HA to do my cross-site failover for me. I want to say that if a host in site A fails, then I want that VM to recover on, on a host in site B. Okay? Well, the, the problem with that, it, 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 is, it is possible, yes, okay, to do that. The problem with that is that HA right now is not site aware. We have no way of going in defining sites for VMware HA. So on a per site basis, I can't define or, or, or control failover configurations. You know, in VMware HA, I can go in and say, here's my designated failover host. I can't do that on a per site basis. So if I were to do that, if I were to say, I want a designated failover host, that failover host is either going to be in site A or it's going to be in site B, but you can't say for site A I want this host and for site B I want that host. Go ahead. What would the new DRS rules important? Hold that thought. Okay. He's talking about DRS host affinity groups. I'm going to get there. Don't worry. Okay. Um, so I, I can't control over, I can't control failover designation. I can't say, uh, you know, I want this designated host for site A and this for me. I can't control a failover capacity on first site. For example, if I say I want the cluster to be able to tolerate 33% uh, of the hosts failing, I can't say I want 33% for this site and 33% for that site. Right? If I define a failover capacity of 25% and I have a host, a cluster, a stretch cluster of eight hosts, then when two hosts fail, oh, sorry, 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 yeah, okay, do my When two hosts fail, then it's reached its capacity. If those two hosts are in site A and you have a failure in site B, you can see your failover capacity because you cannot define per site failover capacity. You can't define per site failover host. You can't define per site admission controls. I can't say, don't allow another VM to be powered up in site B because I don't have enough capacity in site B, even though I might have capacity in site A. All right? So we can do some of this stuff, but the fact that these fundamental pieces within VMware HA don't have the ability to be site aware provides some considerations for us. Okay? Not to say that we can't do that, not to say that you can't use VMware HA or you can't use VMware DRS or any of these things, but go into it knowing what you're getting out of it. Be aware. Um, I'll borrow words, words that so many of these DXs have heard. Know the impact. Okay? Know the impact of your design decision. If you decide to do a stretch cluster and you enable HA, just know what that means. Okay? Here's some other things to keep in mind. All right? Uh, right now, in the current uh, incarnation, you can't put more than eight hosts in an HA enabled stretch cluster. Why? If you put more than eight in a stretch cluster, one way or another, you're going to have five or more in one of those two sites, okay? Unless you go three sites and we haven't even gotten there, okay? Um, but, uh, and if you, as soon as you go more than four sites in a single, uh, single site, then you run the risk of all your primary nodes being in that site. If that site fails and all your primary nodes are down, what happens? AJ just, oh yeah, everybody failed. Oh, look at that, man. That's a mess now, isn't it? Okay? You've got to have at least one primary node to be able to restart. If all your primary nodes are on one site, they'll be down your host. We can't control where the HA primary nodes show up. Well, okay, let's put it this way. There's no supported way of making it work. Okay? Do you want to base your business on an unsupported mechanism? I didn't think so. Alright? So yes, there is a DAS dot preferred primaries that you can go and set. It's not supported. Okay, question. What, why eight? I thought you can put 32 hosts in one cluster. You absolutely can put a cluster. Yes, why eight? The maximum for a VMware HA cluster is indeed 32 hosts. And there are a maximum of five of those being primary nodes. So if I have two sites and I have nine hosts, one of those two sites is going to have five. And that means you immediately run the risk of all five being on the site. Okay, yeah. All right, so now, I mean, we talk about the same thing when, when designing late, late chassis. You're going to put VMware HAs across, or VMware HA cl uh, cluster across blade chassis, and we say, don't run more than four blades in any given chassis. Because as soon as you do, if that chassis goes down, HA's down, forget it. All bets are off. Okay, so that's a common design consideration. Um, so that's something else to consider. Now, I'll, some of you may have inside information that others of you do not. 
Okay? So I will simply say that we're talking about current software right now. All right, so DRS. Again, one of the primary reasons that customers build stretch clusters is they want to do dynamic work, load balancing. They want to be able to say, I need to move this workload over here. Or I want to have DRS automatically move the workload over there. Okay, very cool. Well, the problem is that DRS, like HA, is not fully site aware. But to remind people, as you uh, brought up for us, we do have a mechanism that can mimic some form of site awareness through a DRS host affinity rules. How many people are using DRS host affinity rules in their environments today? All right, very good. Um, now, uh, for those of you that are everybody using DRS host affinity rules, stick your hands up again. How many of you have more than 100 VMs you're managing with DRS host affinity rules? How many of you have more than 200 VMs you're managing with those DRS host affinity rules? Yeah, now all the hands are down. Why? It's a lot of work. All right, they're not dynamic. If you add a new VM, it doesn't automatically join with DRS host affinity group. Okay? If you need to, to modify those groups, you have to go in and, and modify them. It, there's, there's no policy that says if a VM powers up and is stored on this data store, then it should automatically be a member of this group or anything of that nature. We don't have any sort of scalable mechanism for making DRS host affinity rules a, a means whereby we can truly create a site awareness for DRS. Okay? There's administrative overhead. So it's not to say that you can't do it. You can do it, okay? Um, and in, in many cases, creating most of rules with the required status, okay, the must or must not, will also influence HA. If HA can find an alternate startup location, if it cannot, it will violate a required rule. Okay, so it's still not truly a site definition. Uh, but because of the management overhead, this doesn't scale very well. So if you want to do this, that's fine. You can do this. You can use DRS host affinity groups and host affinity rules to say that this VM preferentially should run on this group of hosts and this VM should preferentially run on this group of hosts. But as you begin to scale your environment, that creates administrative overhead that somebody has to handle. Yes, sir? Well, when you say that with HA, you're not going to want to exceed more than eight in that cluster anyway. So you Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. The question was, or the statement was, we've said already that our stretch clusters are only going to go to eight hosts anyway, right? So let's say that I have a need for more than eight hosts. Let's say I have a need for 12 hosts. So I decide I'm going to be smart and I'm going to stick. Um, I'm going to create two clusters. I'm going to stick you know, three and three and three and three, and that way I'm evenly distributed and everything's great. Uh, well, now I've just doubled my administrative overhead. Because when I created their DRS host affinity group with cluster one, I then have to go match that DRS host affinity group with cluster two. And the same goes for site B. So now instead of having one set of administrative overhead, I now have two sets of administrative overhead for two different clusters that do not share configuration with each other. So if I change cluster one, it doesn't change cluster two. So does it really scale? No. But it is predictable. It, predictable is fine, but we're not talking about predictability. We're talking about administrative overhead. Okay. And, and as you begin to scale your environment, okay, well, never mind. Okay, I'm on timeline, so I'm not going to go there. Let's just administrative overhead is something we all need to be concerned about. Okay, all right. So let's move into our next session. Uh, network. There is a fair amount of networking complexity that's added here. Okay, we have layer two uh, adjacency or its equivalent that you have to create between these two sites. Okay. So we have a lot of different technologies here, okay? Uh, could be Cisco OTV, uh, overlay transport virtualization, could be, um, uh, Brocade's got a piece, I don't remember what it's called, uh, V, V, I don't know, I don't want to say you wrong. Brocade has got a piece on there. F5, so they mentioned uh, using F5 to do some, some piece uh, to create the, the equivalence of layer two adjacency, okay? Either way you look at it, not that these things are inherently bad or wrong or anything of that nature, but they are typically more complex than not. They add something new to the environment or to the equation that wasn't there before. Um, now, the, the, the straight, just the, the layer two adjacency is one thing, and um, that's fine. 
But then what a lot of people forget to talk about as well is the, the routing of traffic when you start moving VMs back and forth between these two and how do we address those, okay? Um, so there's a lot of work that's going into there, and we'll talk in just a moment about what all this, location ID separation. Look at your ID separation protocol. Did I get that right, Jake? All right, very good, thank you. <laughs> um, which separates the, the routing decision based on IP address from the identity of a VM based on IP address, so that we can begin to move these things around and not have this crazy kind of traffic patterns. The, the thing is that all these things are, these are all, for lack of a term, they're all cutting edge technologies, okay? They haven't been, widely adopted. Um, yes, we're seeing adoption at a rapid pace because they do simplify. It's far easier, for example, to work with OTV than to create VPLS pseudo-wires, okay? Uh, and a lot of the issues with VPLS pseudo-wires are addressed in the way OTV works. But nevertheless, it's still not as broadly adopted as some of the other technologies. So we're talking about technologies that are still new, they're still evolving, um, we're still waiting to see broad adoption by multiple vendors. Um, across multiple platforms, uh, and that I think gives a lot of people pause to say, well, you know, is this what I want to do? Let, let's look at some of the networking challenges real quick. And again, none of these are insurmountable. I don't want you to take away from this. I do not want you to take away from this presentation that stretch clusters are a bad idea. Okay, they have a valid use case, but I, what I do want you to take away from this presentation is what uh, a deeper knowledge of what the considerations are before you go out there and build it and get surprised. Okay. Nobody likes surprises, especially when they're not good surprises. So we've got a typical sort of setup here. We've got some remote host, of, could be a customer, could be a, an internal end user, whatever. But they're somewhere out there on the WAN, and they're going to access a VM sitting in a data center in site A. Okay? So they look up addresses, DNS host resolution, the usual kind of stuff, and it creates a, a, a path through the network to that particular VM. Okay, everything's great, good, fine, wonderful, no big deal. Well then, the administrator says, you know, I need to move this VM over to the other site. And so he, he or she initiates a, a migration. The VM moves over to the other site. And so now the, the uh, end user, customer, uh, partner, whatever the case may be, says, oh, I need to communicate with this particular VM. So they do the DNS lookups. And of course, the IP address doesn't change, right? Huh? No, no, because if the IP address changed, it wouldn't be a live migration button. <laughs> you know, if the IP address changed, then all your sessions would get dropped and everybody would have to reconnect. So that, you know, we're talking about no IP address change, no DNS lookup changes, anything of that nature, all right? And so the client says, I need to connect, and so it, it goes out, looks at that IP address, looks at the DNS name, goes through the network. Well, now the VM is in a different location, okay? And so the traffic now has to do this sort of thing, and then back again. It has to come into the original data center because that's where the routing takes it. And it has to go across that tunnel, uh, whether it be OTV or DPLS or whatever you know, technology you're using is, to hit the VM on the other side and then back again. And even though this particular piece doesn't look like a horseshoe, thanks to my awesome uh, drawing skills, <laughs> what we call that is horseshoe back because it has to go over to the other data center and then back again, rather than knowing that, oh, well, that VM is now over here. And so that's the subject of technologies like LISP and others. If you're interested, there's an RFC that was published. I believe it's 6115 um, is one that publishes a number of different options for how uh, networking vendors could go about addressing this sort of thing, separating the location of a VM um, from um, the identity of a VM. Okay, being able to say, I can make routing decisions without necessarily having to tie that routing decision to the identity of the VM based on its network address. And those uh, are evolving and still coming, and, and uh, they will help address this, okay? But it's something that you need to plan for. We also need to plan for, okay, you know, how do we address uh, first hop redundancy, okay? Uh, you know, how do we make sure that if the, those routers are down, one of those routers goes down uh, for whatever reason, or the gateway goes down, that it can still get to the rest of the network. And so as you start building redundancy into the designs, then you, you uh, are um, having to be very careful and plan carefully uh, about what your network's gonna look like, okay? Again, lots of, lots of very intense effort being focused on this uh, from a variety of vendors. Um, so I do encourage you to go talk with your, um, your preferred network vendor, find out what their current story is, find out where they're headed, and if you're interested in doing stretch clusters or evaluating that as an option, be sure that you have a good understanding of that. So, questions, yes sir? Yeah, this, um, this particular topic 
discussion where I work. And uh, one of the network security guys pointed out to me that by using the layer two approach to solve this problem from the stretch cluster, you pass under some of the very security mechanisms because you're dropping down the layer two. He was pointing out that one vendor had come up with something new called like security tags, similar to VLAN tags, okay. that allows you to assign security as you drop or create this layer two of that. Okay, all right. Um, you're going underneath access control lists and things like that. Well, you, you are to a certain extent, but you're still operating on a layer three identity. Okay. okay. So the question was around, you know, as you drop down the layer two, you create this layer two equivalents. Are there security cons concerns? Are there considerations we need to keep in mind? And obviously, we always need to keep security at the top of our mind. Uh, but even though we are dropping down to a layer two equivalents here, I actually see the layer two equivalents as being more of uh, you know, managing traffic um, in terms of you don't want to subject, subject yourself to broadcast forms. You don't want to subject yourself to unnecessary traffic going across the layer two tunnel. We want to be efficient with the use of that, of that, uh, of that interconnect. Um, less than that security concern because regardless of whether I am whether that VM's running in site A or running in site B, it still has this identity on the network, this particular IP address, this particular host name, and I can still create ACLs. And generally, I would create ACLs based on a layer three identity and not on a layer two identity. Um, that's just my perspective, and I'm not a security expert for that. Go talk to Ed Blake. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but that, that's a good point. Certainly something we need to keep in mind. Other questions? All right. Um, how am I doing on time? I need to hurry. Okay. So a quick uh, uh, run through here. The other thing to keep around, uh, keep in mind, is operational considerations. Okay. The technological considerations are fine, and there, there are lots of ways to work around technological considerations. We can limit our cluster size. We can use multiple clusters. We can write PowerShell scripts and update our DRS host affinity groups. We can, um, you know. Uh, put in the appropriate networking infrastructure and use whatever technologies are available to do that, but we're still operational concerns. If I move a VM from site A to site B, how does it affect its backup? Who's backing it up? Where is that backup being stored? Okay. Um, how does that affect uh, actual people? Okay, personnel, support. What if somebody needs to put their hands on where, uh, the host that's running that VM? How do we know which host it's on in which location? Okay. Um, what about disaster recovery and replication? Uh, is your ability to move back and forth between these sites, does that, do, do, you, do you sacrifice something in being able to use a third site for replication for actual failover? You know, can I do two active sites and a third passive site? Well, not today, because SRM doesn't do three sites. SRM does two sites, okay? Unless I'm wrong. Oh, very good. <laughs> um, so these kinds of considerations also keep in mind. Uh, not to say that we can't do stretch clusters, again, but just go into it thinking about these other pieces, okay? So, real quick, um, we'll take a forward-looking view and then I'll open it up for additional questions or let you guys get out of here and get ready for your next session. So, we talk about HADRS. HADRS are what I call their greatest strength and yet their greatest weakness at the same time for stretch clusters. The advantages of stretch clusters and the reason people build stretch clusters are because they want to do this, this failover between sites because they want to do this automatic dynamic workload balancing. But because we don't have site awareness, right, we, we, we lose some functionality there. We, we have some, some considerations we need to keep in mind. So any benefits or any, any improvements that are made to the HODRS infrastructure that to tie directly to this idea of site awareness are going to have an immediate benefit to building stretch clusters. So if, if VMware were to change primary secondary node behaviors, if they were to change the way primary nodes are elected, or the way primary nodes behave, or the number of primary nodes, or uh, ways, supported ways of controlling primary nodes, if any of those things were implemented by VMware, they would have a direct impact on the considerations of what you need to do or should do for stretch clusters. Same goes for the emission control algorithm. If they were to change that, hold that thought for one second. If they were to change the emission control algorithm, then that would, that would change the way HA applies. Same goes for a policy-based or, or more scalable host affinity rule management, a way to say, I'm going to define a policy and I'm going to apply that policy based on tags or properties or values to find a VM. So if there wasn't all that administrative overhead, then GRS host affinity rules could become that mechanism whereby we mimic site awareness. That question here or comment. So, so you're saying, uh, hypothetically, if VMware were to make these changes, 
I, I am speaking hypothetically, that's correct. <laughs> Remember that I said nothing in here should be taken as an indication of anything. So just keep that in mind. All right? Um, but th that's the, the, the key here is to get you thinking about these other areas, thinking about how a change in one area could affect other areas. So if, if there is a change in HADRX behavior, what impact does that have to the ability to build such clusters or the size of your clusters or how you manage those clusters or the operational considerations around clusters, okay? Same goes um, on the networking side. As, as uh, network companies like Cisco and Brocade and, and uh, you know, Forced in and all you know, whoever else out there is these days, okay? Um, as they begin to continue to focus very heavily on how we how we address this issue of VM mobility without creating crazy routing schemes and all kinds of other things, then that's going to have direct impact on the viability and the value of stretch clusters in your enterprise, okay? So looking at this, or looking at some of the alternative alternatives listed at RFC 6115 to decouple network identity from network routing decisions. Looking at OTV or other layer two equivalents, or some mechanism whereby we can mask that using virtual IPs on a load balancer to direct traffic. Okay, that's a mechanism as well too. Okay, um, what is virtualization other than a layer of abstraction? If we were to insert a layer of abstraction at the IP layer, we could address a lot of those a lot of those concerns. Is that a viable approach? Is that something we need to do? Okay, those are things to consider. But in the longer term, the need for layer two adjacency at a broader or it's equivalent at a broad scale is really something that we need to address. I don't know what the answers are here, but we need to fix the, the underlying basic need to emulate or, or pretend that things are layer two adjacent. Okay? That's a much bigger sea change that has to occur in order for us to be able to have workload mobility. I'm not talking just stretch clusters, but workload mobility for private to hybrid cloud movement. Okay? Everybody talks about that as being the, the, the holy grail. Oh, right? You know, Light shining down from heaven, and angels, and all that wonderful jazz. But it's not going to happen okay, until this sort of issue has a solid cross vendor answer. Okay? And again, I don't have any inside information here, so there you go. Um, again, key here is storage. So as you begin to see more solutions that, uh, that truly present read write storage at both locations at the same time, that enables new ways of, of thinking about what if I really could have read-write access to my storage at site A and site B at the same time? What does that allow me to do that I couldn't do before? Because I was bound by the way that I had to structure data and place VMs, okay? Um, one of the big considerations around this read-write storage idea is, is what happens if these read-write storage rates become split in the middle? If they, they occur, what we, what we call split brain, okay? Uh, where the connection between the two controllers or the two clusters goes down. They're like, I don't know what's happened. What do I do now? Is the other site dead or is I just can't reach it? Do I continue reading and writing? If both sides continue reading and writing, then how do you reconcile that data? And every product has a different way of addressing that. Some of them will just go dead on one side and continue writing on the other or vice versa. But what about the idea to say, uh, I want to have a, uh, uh, something like a majority <laughs> node set or quorum set kind of scenario where uh, some um, third third site is going to look at these two and say, okay, you two can't talk to each other, but you're up and you're down, so I'm going to tell you, you go ahead and go, right? Some, some sort of third site piece that's going to fix that, right? That's an option. Or, or we start talking about multiple sites. You know, we got three sites or four sites all talking to each other, sharing data, and how do we determine who's dead and who's not, okay? And then more direct integration of replication, um, and support for that in, in VMware technology so that we can build technologies like sync, sync, async, right? Be able to say, I'm going to do a sync to sync, synchronous to synchronous, read, write, and then a third site doing asynchronous over here and be able to manage all that and use SRM to handle the payload. Okay? And that's kind of the ideal. That would be like the perfect scenario is to have two synchronous mirrored sites with workload balancing and site awareness and all that kind of stuff with the ability to fail over, regardless of where they're running here, failovers are a third asynchronous site. Um, and have that all managed and, and controlled by workflow. Right. So these are all things that look for in the future that, you know, as an industry, these need to move ahead in order to actually be able to address a lot of the challenges that customers want. All right, so I know I am way over schedule, uh, but feel free, um, I'll go ahead and dismiss everybody. Feel free to come by uh, either up here or back there and ask questions on behalf of you. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.